Jonathan uh, to uh, uh, our uh, CIFAR seminar uh, uh, series. Um, uh, to remind you, there's um, uh, three parts uh, to today's program. The first is um, will be um, an ESI talk. We um, uh, like to feature one of our local ESIs before every invited speaker, um, uh, followed by um, uh, the talk, uh, invited talk by Xu uh, Yu uh, from Harvard. Uh, and then the second hour will feature uh, a scientific spotlight um, uh, on the Hark uh, Center that uh, Nevin Krogan will uh, lead. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our ESI speaker of the day. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Zi Chong Li, a uh, research scientist in Melanie Ott's lab at Gladstone. Um, he was born in China, and after a master's thesis on shrimp white spot syndrome virus, he completed his PhD at UC Berkeley, exploring the functions of human transcription elongation machinery in HIV. With prior experience on genome-wide uh, genetic screens in the, in the Ott lab at Gladstone, his focus has been to derive unbiased comprehensive networks of validated gene pairs supporting critical biologic and pathologic processes, including chronic HIV infection. And in his most recent work, which he will share with us today, he, he identifies novel gene interactions that might be harnessed uh, in silencing HIV. Um, uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Zi Chong, uh, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Take it away. Oh, thank you, Peter, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And I will share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so let's get started. So good morning. Uh, I'm a research scientist in the Dr. Madeline Arts Lab at Gladstone, and it's my honor today to present besides Dr. Xu Yu. And I was chosen because, uh, like Dr. Yu, I'm also studying the mechanisms of HIV persistence, but from a different angle. So today I will talk about our discovery of a new super complex transcriptionally silencing HIV. A couple of years ago, Dr. Yu's group reported that proviruses from elite controllers are in a deep state of latency. In elite controllers, the viruses are mostly integrated in inaccessible heterochromatins far from the cellular transcription star sites and are covered by repressive chromatin marks. The strong viral transcriptional suppression observed in elite controllers highlights the possibility of a functional cure through block and lock approaches to achieve an art-free remission. But in a regular people living with HIV, the viruses are preferentially integrated in actively transcribed genes. The LTR promoter can be accessed by transcription factors such as nf kappa b which then recruits RNA polymerase 2 and the positive transcription elongation factor PTFB to engage in full throttle viral expression. The HIV latency is the result of many host repressors that target, for example, nf kappa b PTFB, the polymerase, and as the out lab discovered several years earlier, the bath brd 4 s complex pushes the nucleosomes into the LTR to stop viral transcription. By inserting a GFP gene downstream of LTR, we could use GFP expression to quantify the HIV activity. And this allows us to test the contributions of each factor to HIV latency by knocking them down. We found that knocking down individual host repressors increased HIV expression as shown here, but the effect of knocking down single repressors are mild. In contrast, we found that knocking down pairs of repressors at the same time could synergistically react with latent HIV. So here, PMS, PSMD8 is a key subunit in proteasome, and CYLD is a repressor for nf kappa b When we knock down them at the same time, the latency reversing effect is much higher than the predicted additive effect. So we hypothesized that there could be hidden host repressors that by themselves alone have no effect, but could synergize with known host repressors to inhibit HIV expression. So we selected eight known host repressors identified by us and others. Uh, they represent various cellular pathways. 
and we developed this platform to probe the entire genome for genes that synergize with each of them. So we first constructed these two types of vectors. In the query vector, we cloned one guide RNA targeting one of the eight HIV repressors. And in the input vector, we cloned a library of guide RNAs targeting all the human genes. And because they have different selection markers, we introduced both vectors into the same cells that are latently infected with a GFP-labeled HIV. And then we use DOCS to turn on the CRISPR interference. And we iteratively enriched the input guide RNAs that synergize with each query guide RNA. So far, we have found 32 synergies among 11 host genes in different functional groups. And three of them are, are, are new, BCL7C, cancer 2 and 32. So here is primary data behind one of the synergies. The combined knockdown of BCL7C and ICABB alpha reactivated HIV in more than tenfold cells than their individual knockdowns combined. And we further found that overexpressing the three new host repressors could reduce HIV reactivation. Here we sent the expression vectors of BCL7C, cancer 2 r 32 into the CD4 T cells donated by people living with HIV and treated the cells with either DMSO as control or PMA and ionomycin uh, to trigger HIV replication. And when we quantified the amount of HIV RNA in the cells using qPCR, we found that the increased cellular levels of BCL7C, cancer 2 or 32, could reduce HIV replication by about 50%. So this data qualified BCL7C, cancer 2 and 32 as bona fide host repressors of latent HIV reactivation. And mechanistically, when we did chromatin immunoprecipitation in T cells latently infected with HIV, we found that overexpression of BCL7C or cancer 2 increased acetylated nucleosomes and this protein called BRD4S on the HIV promoter. So this protein BRD4S has a pocket on it called bromodomins. It can grab these acetyl groups and recruit other factors to stabilize the nucleosome on HIV. So BCL7C is part of the BATH complex, which can position the nucleosome onto the, H onto the DNA. And the cancer 2 is part of the NSL complex that has a catalytic subunit called CAT8 that can add these acetyl marks onto the nucleosome. And interestingly, we purified from the cells a large protein complex that contains both parts of BATH and NSL, including these proteins labeled here. And we found that proteins in this complex work together to bring CAT8 closer to the nucleosomes to add more of these acetyl marks onto the HIV RTR. So in the future, we plan to identify the complete components of the BATH and SL supercomplex, elucidate the exact histomodifications induced by, NS by NSL that attracts BRD4S, how this protein complex regulates human genes, and search for drugs that block HIV through this pathway. And our long-term goal is to identify more host factors that synergistically regulate HIV expression and by learning from them and targeting them, try to permanently silence HIV. So first I want to thank the, all the research participants from the HIV AIDS community that made our research possible. I thank my mentors, colleagues, and friends in the community in Gladstone, and especially the Hope Collaboratory. And this research was initially supported by a pilot grant from CHRP and is now fully funded by the Hope grants from NIH. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks, that was that was terrific. Um, yeah. So we'll open it up uh, to questions. Um, uh, feel free to raise them. Monica has a question. Please. Um, thank you so much. That was really a great talk. Um, I have a question which sounds simplistic, but um, 
in these different care strategies, do you want to permanently silence HIV or do you want to actually activate HIV, make the cells targetable, um, have the HIV be expressed so that they're killed by CTLs and um, try to cure HIV that way? Like, are these really fundamentally different approaches or can they be used simultaneously? And I know Hope and Dare are doing different things, but if you could explain that to more of a, a lay audience about, about the, the strategy of silencing forever. Okay, uh, that, that's a wonderful question and a very important question. I think this information I discovered can be used for both block and lock and shock and kill, or their combination called reduce and control. It depends on whether we can find activators that can increase these protein functions or inhibitors that can inhibit these protein functions. So uh, for example, I have preliminary data, but I don't have time to show that I have activator called um, SMAP2, which is a PP2A activator. It can activate PP2A, which in turn can activate the function of, integrist, of integrator. And that PP2A activator can synergize with other small molecules that uh, block transcription elongation. In that, so those are the drugs that belong to the block and lock pathway, block and lock strategy. But I also have some preliminary data showing that some inhibitors in this, uh, in this, uh, for these factors, they do have some uh, shock and kill activity. They can react with HIV latency. So I think it can, the knowledge I discovered here can benefit either strategy depending on available drugs. That's really clear. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Dave, you have a question? Oh, yeah. I always have questions about this work because. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really on the cutting edge of cure science. Um, but I, I know that you guys in HOPE are looking at endogenous retroviruses, I assume as a sort of an example of a state in which retroviruses can be permanently frozen and shut down. So are these pathways involved in, in HERV biology? You guys looking at that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, we have collaboration with um, Dr. S uh, with Cedric from Canal, and they are experts of uh, HERV. And I think some of the mechanisms like this BRD4S mechanism, uh, they are also involved in silencing uh, endogenous retroviruses. And we are actively testing the, the underlying mechanisms in the endogenous retroviruses and see whether we can leverage the Krebsinger finger, Krebsinger finger proteins uh, for, uh, from the, uh, the silencing of the HERV and then use that knowledge to also silence HIV because HERV, they have very strong uh, crafting finger proteins. They can actually recruit not only FBI4S, but also some other factors and combine them together to synergistically silence HERV. And we are learning from them and try to use this knowledge to silence HIV. Thank you. Thank you. Great. A uh, terrific uh, discussion. Uh, so um, uh, now we can move on to the next um, uh, part of our series. Uh, Zi Chung, would you like to introduce our speaker? Okay. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Xu Yu. Dr. Yu is a co-member of the Reagan Institute, an associate professor of medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, Brangham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Dr. Yu earned her MD in 1999 from China Medical University and completed postdoctoral training in the AIDS Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Yu's laboratory focuses on the mechanisms of immune control of viral infection through strategic interdisciplinary collaborations that combine both basic immunological science with clinical and translational perspectives, her team made important discoveries about the roles of dendritic cells in generating and fine-tuning adaptive immune responses during HIV infection. Particularly, her team's impactful work on viral reservoir profiles in HIV elite controllers was selected as one of the nine runners up to the 2020 breakthrough of the year by the Science Magazine. And I'm honored to welcome her to UCSF today. Her talk is entitled, Cure of HIV Infection, Lessons Learned from Elite Controllers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. 
thank you to home for for the uh, kind uh, introduction yeah uh, let me share my screen can you see it yeah perfect great yeah no thanks so much for having me um i'm sorry that i was not able to uh, join in person uh, but what i would like to present today um some of you probably have heard some of part of the data um some of the uh the, the lessons we learned from ED controllers and then discuss how this might be uh, relevant for the majority of the people uh, living with HIV. So uh, for this audience, I don't need to say too much. Uh, we know HIV reservoir represents a major barrier to a cure of HIV infection. And even though the number of these reservoir cells is relatively small in the setting of um, ART, but they can fuel HIV rebound viremia uh, very quickly after treatment interruption. So because of the persisting uh, character of these reservoir cells, when we talk about a cure for HIV infection, uh, we normally discuss two forms of a possible cure. And one we call it a virological cure. And so that's more a classical form of a cure. Um, in this sense, we'll eliminate all HIV infected cells, or at least all uh, HIV infected cells that encode for uh, replication content uh, HIV. Um, but the second form, oh, sorry, um, the, the, the second form of a cure uh, is a drug-free uh, remission or functional cure. So this is possible even in the uh, person with persisting uh, reservoir cells. And these people are still able to maintain uh, undetectable plasma viral load uh, in the absence of therapy. Okay, so um, ED controllers really um, represent the closest possible approximation of a cure. And um, thankfully, Bruce and Steve have started establishing the uh, ED controller cohorts almost two decades ago, and which recruited hundreds and even uh, thousands of ED controllers uh, for uh, us to access samples. And this unique cohort really gives us the opportunity uh, to look into two major questions. Uh, first, can a virological cure of HIV infection occur uh, naturally? And secondly, uh, what are the characteristics of uh, drug-free durable remission of uh, HIV infection? So to address uh, these questions, um, we started 72 ED controllers and recruited uh, 41 uh, ART-suppressed individual uh, as a reference. And you can see from uh, this table that these two cohorts are very similar in uh, all parameters, except the ED controllers were not treated, um, while the uh, participants in the ART uh, cohort received about a median of nine years of uh, continuous suppressive uh, antiretroviral therapy. So we first would like to quantify the reservoir sizes uh, in these two study cohorts. And um, when we talk about the HIV, HIV reservoir cells, as you all know very well, um, uh, we need to make a distinction between the intact and uh, defective proviruses. So majority of the HIV proviruses are defective, and only about 5 to 10% of the proviruses are actually intact. And um, when the opportunity comes, they would have the ability to give rise to uh, replication-competent uh, viruses. So in order to distinguish these two types of proviruses, uh, we establish um, our first generation assay, the so-called lipstick assay. Uh, basically, after diluting the uh, proviruses to single genome level, we amplify the HIV 9KB long uh, genome. And then uh, the PCR products is sent for sequencing and analyzed used the uh, uh, bioinformatic uh, pipelines uh, that we have here. And this assay allow us to really distinguish uh, the intact potentially replication content proviruses from the majority of the uh, proviruses that are defective. So using this assay, we find that as expected, um, both the total and intact proviral reservoir sizes are smaller in ED controllers compared to uh, ART suppressed uh, individuals. Uh, but surprisingly, we actually observe a much wider range of the uh, frequency of intact proviruses in ED controllers. Some ED controllers have very high levels of intact proviruses, higher than majority of the uh, uh, people on suppressive art. 
but um, some have extremely low uh, to undetectable levels of uh, intact proviruses. So especially these two ED controllers who had no detectable intact proviruses despite we um, analyzed a large uh, amount of cells. So the question here is whether a virological cure of HIV infection may have occurred naturally in these two uh, exceptional ED controllers. So we all know very well the Berlin patient and the more uh, recently the Linden patient have been the gold standard for a virological cure uh, of HIV infection. Uh, especially for the Berlin patient, extensive uh, virological testing uh, has been done. So despite analyzing um, 1.4 billion CD4 T cells in viral articles, I say um, no replication competent viruses uh, were detected. So similarly to the Berlin patient, uh, the two exceptional ED controllers we identified also had no detectable intact or replication competent uh, HIV proviruses in massive number of cells uh, that were analyzed uh, using uh, complementary assays. Although it can never be definitively proven, uh, it seems that these two patients may have uh, achieved a virological cure of HIV infection through their natural immunity. But I, I would like to point out that due to the next generation sequencing assay uh, that were, we uh, conducted here, in both of these exceptional DD controllers, we did detect multiple um, defective proviruses in their blood cells, indicating that both these patients were clearly infected um, and active cycles of uh, viral replication had occurred at some point uh, in vivo. So on the other hand, uh, many of the ED controllers uh, can maintain spontaneous control of HIV despite uh, pretty high levels of intact uh, proviral reservoirs. And they seem to have reached a state of a durable uh, drug remission of um, HIV infection. Uh, therefore, this is a great opportunity for us to really understand the unique features of a functional cure uh, of HIV infection. Um, so for this, we decided to focus on the chromosomal locations of uh, integrated HIV proviruses. So HIV is small, but very smart. Uh, uh, many of the prior studies have consistently shown that both in CD4 uh, T cells from HIV infected individual or in in vitro infected CD4 T cells, uh, about 80 to 90% of all HIV proviruses were integrated into uh, genes, which only make up a, a very small uh, fraction of the human genome. So HIV proviruses integrated into these genetic regions uh, could take advantage of all the host gene transcription and machinery for their own uh, replications. But in con contrast, only about 10 to 20% of HIV proviruses ended up in the non-genic regions that actually constitute the majority of the human genome. So there are clearly a uh, preferential integration of uh, HIV proviruses into the genetic regions of the uh, human genomes. Uh, however, these uh, previous analyses did not allow to distinguish the intact or defective proviruses and their uh, uh, respective integration site. So to address this, we developed our uh, second generation assay, the so-called MAPSEQ assay, and basically, after diluting the proviruses to single genome level, we conducted a whole genome ampli uh, amplification process. And then this will give us enough material uh, to profile both the near full length provirus sequences as well as their uh, corresponding uh, chromosomal integrity set for each individual uh, proviruses. So here's an example of intact uh, reservoir profile in the ART treated individual uh, who have been on suppressive art for about 11 years. So this is the phylogenetic tree of all intact proviruses we detected in this individual. As you can see, uh, these intact proviruses are quite diverse, with the majority of them um, integrated into the genetic uh, regions, with uh, only a small um, proportion of these intact proviruses are in non-genic or pseudogenic uh, regions. Here's an example of a unique controllers who was um, diagnosed with HIV infection about 28 years ago. I've never been treated. I had no detectable uh, <coughs> viremia, at least for the past 12 years that we have record for. And you can see here that uh, while doing very well clinically, 
this ED controller has one of the highest uh, intake uh, reservoir uh, sizes in our ED controller cohort. And it is higher than most of the ART um, treated individuals. And again, this is the phylogenetic tree of all the intact proviruses we detected uh, in this ED controllers. So I like the diverse profile we just saw in the uh, ART treated individual. We have only detected two large clusters of um, intact proviruses. Uh, the intact proviruses within each cluster share 100% viral sequences as well as uh, integration site. Um, the, this indicating this is a clonal expansion of these uh, infected cells harboring these uh, intact uh, proviruses. So in the first cluster, uh, the intact proviruses is integrated into a centromeric cyanide DNA region uh, in chromosome seven. Uh, so uh, you may know that a centromeric cyanide DNA is a form of uh, heterochromatin and is far away from any uh, host gene transcription star site, and therefore is also referred to as a gene uh, desert. Uh, you can imagine that intact proviruses integrated into these regions would have very limited chance um, to be reactivated and have, because they have no access to host gene uh, transcription machinery that easily. And uh, in the second cluster, the intact proviruses is integrated into crab ZF gene in from 19 that uh, uh, Jin Chung has uh, told you a little bit, uh, which is also characterized as the heterochromatin. So this region is packed with uh, a lot of repressive uh, chromatin marks. Again, um, you can imagine the intact provars is integrated into these regions, uh, also likely in the state of uh, deep viral latency. So here, just to summarize uh, some of these analysis. So in the ART suppressed individuals, you can see the majority of the intact proviruses were integrated into the ordinary uh, genic regions, which are more permissive to uh, their reactivation. However, uh, over 60% of the intact proviruses in ED controllers uh, were integrated into uh, non-genic regions, sand DNA regions, or the crab DF gene regions. All of them uh, are associated with uh, deep latency. So this raises the next set of questions. Um, is the intact proviral integration site landscape in ED controllers relate to the altered integration site uh, preference at the beginning of infection? Or is it the result of immune-mediated clearance of uh, intact proviruses located in those permissive uh, chromatin locations over time? Um, we address th these questions in two ways. So first, um, we infect the CD4 T cells from 12 ED controllers and nine uh, HIV negative healthy donors with a GFP encoding HIV um, uh, viruses. And we then uh, conducted chromosomal integration site analysis and retrieved over uh, 120,000 uh, HIV integration sites. Um, so overall, you can see that uh, very similar to what you see in CD4 T cells uh, from HIV negative donors, uh, HIV proviruses are largely integrated into genic locations in these um, uh, in vitro infected CT4 T cells uh, from ED controllers as well. So there's really no evidence for uh, preferential targeting of centromere, cyanide DNA, or crab TF gene in these newly infected CT4 T cells from uh, ED controllers. Uh, secondly, we also analyzed uh, integration site on defective proviruses in the same study participants from the two uh, study cohort. Uh, you can see here the integration uh, of defective proviruses from ED controllers resembles uh, what we see in ART surprises uh, individual, both uh, intact and defective, with the majority located in the regular uh, genetic regions. So both sets of experiments indicate that the uh, integration site profile of intact proviruses in ED controllers is most likely the result of uh, immune selection pressure that was able to eliminate um, intact proviruses in those uh, permissive genic regions. And uh, what is also interesting uh, to note that the intact and defective proviruses seems to be under different levels of immune selection pressure. Um, this is something we do not fully understand, uh, but it's, it's really interesting. So the next obvious question would be uh, whether the proviruses in these particular heterochromatin regions that we are talking about are truly more uh, transcriptionally uh, silent. 
So in order to answer this question, we have developed uh, a third generation assay called PrepSeq. So after diluting uh, HIV reservoir cells to single cell level, DNA and RNA are separated. And then the genomic DNA are going to the pipeline for the MIPSeq assay to identify both the proviral sequences as well as the uh, chromosome integration site. And then the RNA are reverse transcribed and amplified for HIV RNA uh, transcription analysis. Therefore, this um, PrepSeq assay allows the parallel identification of all three components, the proviral sequences, the chromosome integration site, and HIV uh, transcriptional activity for each individual viral reservoir cells uh, without any uh, ex vivo uh, stimulation. Uh, we have done this parallel analysis of all three components in uh, 700 uh, reservoir cells from six ART-treated individuals. Um, consistent with a prior study, the majority of the proviruses in uh, genic regions, um, about 30 to 40% of the proviruses in genes are actually transcriptionally active, while a significantly lower uh, proportion of the proviruses in non-genic regions were uh, producing any HIV RNA. But when we look at the proviruses integrated into uh, non-genic cellular DNA regions, uh, only two out of 34 proviruses were transcribing any detectable levels of HIV RNA. And uh, these are the very region that we just talked about that most of uh, the uh, intact proviruses from elite intruders were located. So it does seem like the, these locations are associated uh, with viral latency, uh, deeper viral latency. Um, so overall, these data indicate that location matters. Uh, one, an intact proviruses is integrated into accessible chromatin. Uh, it is more likely to be uh, actively transcribed, which uh, may allow the uh, intact proviruses to give rise to uh, replication competent uh, viruses or when the opportunity comes. Uh, however, if an intact proviruses is integrated into non-genic or tightly packed uh, heterochromatin regions, the intact proviruses cannot be easily uh, reactivated and it's likely in a deeper state of latency. And we uh, refer to this as a blocked, a locked status. So here's what we propose is happening uh, in these uh, elite controllers. So after early infection, uh, probably most uh, uh, intact proviruses were located in the uh, accessible uh, quantum regions, and only very few uh, intact proviruses will be in these uh, non-genic or heterochromatin regions uh, with deeper latency. So when an uh, autologous uh, reactivation signal comes, such as a cytokine stimulation or antigen stimulation, uh, the intact proviruses in these accessible chromatins uh, have a high likelihood to be reactivated, uh, which will expose these cells to uh, various uh, host immune uh, defense mechanism and uh, increasing the probability that they'll be eliminated by the host immune responses. Uh, so we've referred this uh, process as the autologous uh, shock and cure process. So what we propose is in these naturally cured patients uh, through this autologous shock and cure process over time, all uh, intact proviral reservoirs were completely cleared by their uh, natural immunity. But as we know in the majority of the event that's not happening. And, and it seems like um, the intact proviruses in accessible chromatin are gradually eliminated over time uh, but the intact proviruses in deeper latency persist and even expand. So eventually a blocked and locked intact reservoir profile is reached, uh, mm -hmm. which may be the reason they were able to achieve a durable uh, drug-free remission of IgM infection uh, in these AD controllers. So now the big question is how uh, to apply what we learned from ED controllers to the general population of people uh, living with HIV. Uh, so the first question we ask is, can a long-term ART promote a block lock reservoir profile if we give the immune system uh, enough time? So in order to address this question, we specifically recruited a new cohort, the long-term ART cohort. Uh, the first study included about eight uh, study participants who had been on suppressive ART for a million, 12, uh, 20 years. So these participants really uh, recruited through uh, many of the collaborators uh, from, uh, from uh, UCSF, as well as uh, CASE and ACTG, 
And these are the exact population who started treatment since the ART was um, first introduced. And we also included uh, the moderate ART cohort with a median of nine years of treatment and our elite controller cohort uh, who are not uh, treated uh, as a reference. So first we compare just cross-sectionally the levels of total and intact HIV reservoir sizes in these long-term ART treated individuals after uh, 20 years of ART with those in the two uh, reference cohort. And we saw no significant difference uh, in the quantity of total HIV and intact uh, HIV reservoir sizes between long-term or the moderate uh, duration for ART cohort. But as expected, both ART cohort have higher uh, intact and total reservoir size uh, compared to the ED controllers. However, when we uh, look more uh, in details, uh, you can see the proportion of intact provinces within the total reservoir um, is much higher in the long-term ART uh, treated individuals, similar to uh, ED controllers, uh, much higher than this um, moderate ART uh, cohort. And this is, seems mainly due to the higher proportion of clonal expanded uh, intact uh, reservoir cells uh, in both the long-term ART and ED controller cohorts uh, in comparison to the uh, moderate ART cohort. Here, I just want to show you some example of these uh, intact reservoir profile in long-term ART uh, study participant after two decades of uh, treatment. So in these two individuals, you can see that uh, there's almost uh, monoclonal intact reservoirs enriched in these Central America or Paracentral America uh, satellite DNA region, uh, which probably reminds you what we see um, in uh, ED controllers. And here are another two examples. Even though these two participants have uh, more diverse intact reservoirs with multiple clones, uh, what is interesting is that uh, almost all of them are in non-genic or heterochromatin regions that associated with uh, deeper latency. Uh, so just to summarize uh, this part, uh, the intact reservoir profile in these long-term ART cohort is strikingly similar to that in ED controllers with very high proportion of the intact coronaviruses uh, located in the uh, chromosome locations that associated with uh, deeper latency. So the next, next question is how the uh, proviral reservoir profile evolved over time. And to answer this question, we are very fortunate uh, to be able to uh, get samples longitudinally that um, covers about one year after treatment initiation and 10 years and 20 years after uh, treatment uh, in some of our, our uh, study participants. So here, just one example. Um, so I'm gonna show you, this is a circles plot. And each of these squares is one intact provaro sequences. And then whenever there's an arch like this, meaning this is a clone that's a with 100% sequence identity and uh, same very integration site. So the earliest time point we analyze in this uh, individual is about one year after ART initiation. And we detected uh, several individual uh, intact proviruses as well as one large clone of intact proviruses. So as you can see here, all the intact proviruses detected at this very early time point are in uh, genic locations. So the second time point uh, we have for the study participant is about 12 years after uh, ART treatment. Uh, we see this clone in genic is still uh, persisted, but much smaller. And we also see another small clone in another genic locations, but at the same time, we see a much bigger clone that um, in these uh, central American satellite uh, DNA region in chromosome 18. And in the latest time point, after 20 years of ART, uh, you see that intact uh, proviruses integrated into these central American regions come to dominate the entire uh, intact reservoir profile uh, in this individual. The intact proviruses previously detected in these genic regions cannot be easily detected anymore. So here's another example uh, in this individual. After one year of ART, the majority of the intact proviruses that we detected are in uh, genic locations. But interestingly, even at this very early time point, uh, this individual already have um, 
a clone in uh, paracentromeric uh, DNA regions and another impact proboscis in these uh, DNF gene regions. After nine years of ART treatment, the chromosome 10 uh, paracentromeric clone persisted. And we also see a new chromosome Y uh, paracentromeric clone um, uh, start to appear. And then even the several individual uh, intact proboscis we detected at this time point are already in these non-genic and uh, DNF gene regions. Uh, the previously detected intact proboscis in these genic locations uh, were not detectable anymore, uh, even just after nine years of ART in this uh, particular study participant. So in the final time point, after 20 years of ART, this orange node from some of the uh, chromosome 10 clone still persisted. So it's over 20 years now. And um, the newly detected chromosome Y clone expanded uh, largely and dominating the uh, intact reservoir cell um, profile at this point. Um, so in both of these uh, examples, there seems to be a progressive elimination of intact proviruses. Uh, in genetic locations, where we see a uh, significant um, accumulation of intact proviruses uh, in deeper latency during uh, long-term ART. Uh, however, we did not observe any evidence for the selection of effective proviruses in deeper latency over time. Uh, this again uh, supports our uh, previous observation uh, in ED controllers that uh, seems intact and defective proviruses are under different levels of immune selection pressure in vivo. Just to summarize, um, from the first time point to the last time point over 20 uh, years, we see a significant um, increase of intact proviruses in deeper latency. Well, this trend's only true for intact, but not true for the uh, defective proviruses. So it seems that the autologous shock and cure process that we proposed for ED controllers is also ongoing in um, uh, ART treated individual, but this process probably uh, much slower and much less uh, effective uh, in these ART treated individual. Um, the blocked and locked uh, reservoir profile seems to only be um, reached after a prolonged duration of uh, ART. And it is possible that um, the long term ART treated individual with these block and lock positions uh, become potent controllers after treatment interruption, uh, but obviously this needs to be uh, extensively evaluated in carefully conducted um, future clinical trials. So while we're waiting to conduct a, a proper clinical trial, so probably um, collaborating with many of you, um, we also had the opportunity to analyze reservoir profile in uh, some of the uh, post-treatment controllers identified in uh, prior uh, treatment interruption studies through some several collaborations. For example, um, despite only on ART for uh, six and a half years, this uh, individual were able to um, control viremia remarkably for uh, about four years after uh, treatment interruption. And here's the integration side analysis of all the intact proviruses that we detected in this individual. So as you can see here, before the treatment interruption, this individual has already had an intact reservoir profile with majority of the uh, intact proviruses in these uh, lock lock positions. And this trends um, continued in a subsequent uh, treatment interruption time point. Um, there were a few uh, intact proviruses in accessible uh, chromatin positions, but less detectable over time. And unfortunately, at this point, we do not know whether some of these uh, viral VIPs uh, actually come from some of these um, uh, proviruses in these uh, open chromatins. Again, we did not see the same pattern for defective proviruses, uh, both on ART or during ATI. Most of these defective proviruses remain in the uh, accessible chromatin regions. So here's another example, uh, a PTC from the BEAT2 study. Uh, this individual had um, undetectable viremia for about 46 weeks after treatment interruption, and then we see a viral rebound. Um, in this PDC, again, we found a quite high levels of intact proviruses before treatment interruption, but as you can see, um, 
the majority of the intact coronavirus is detected at this time point are clonal um, and are already in these non-genic locations. And these um, intact proviruses in these non-genic locations uh, persist and dominated the uh, intact reservoir profile on the subsequent time point uh, during ATI. Uh, however, what we see in the PTC is quite different from what we see in persons who rebounded very quickly after a treatment interruption. Uh, as you can see here in this rebounder, before treatment interruption, most of the intact proviruses were in the uh, accessible chromatin uh, regions. So when we summarize the data from four PDCs and three rebounders that we have analyzed uh, so far, you can see that before treatment interruption, uh, a significant proportion of the intact proviruses in PDCs are already in these block lock position. And that could, this pattern is um, very similar to uh, the intact reservoir profile found in the controllers. Well, the uh, intact proviruses from uh, rebounders uh, before treatment and interruption are largely in these um, genic accessible chromatins. So this really raised the possibility that the uh, integrity side profile of intact proviruses before treatment and interruption uh, could be intrinsically associated with uh, either viral control or rebound during the treatment and interruption. Uh, however, um, our study is not powered to really characterize all the subdominant uh, intact proviruses or tissue reservoirs and the subdominant uh, intact proviruses or tissue reservoir could really be the contributor to viral rebound, uh, even in these PDCs at a later time point during the ATI. And this really needs a lot more um, investigation um, uh, in the future. And we're also expanding uh, these analysis in other PDCs and rebounders from other clinical trials. So finally, uh, one critical question is, how this autologous shock and cure process could be accelerated through uh, therapeutic interventions so that only a limited duration for ART would be needed before achieving a full stream control of HIV infection uh, for uh, the people living with HIV. So obviously for this, we need to identify the uh, new factor that drive the progressive immune selection of uh, intact proviruses into deeper latency um, we need to study in controllers and these long-term ART-treated um, uh, participant uh, in more details. Um, but I believe uh, this is really something many of us are actively working on. It's very uh, exciting as well. And finally, I would like to thank uh, all the group members in my lab and in Matthias's lab, and as well as many, many of our long-term uh, collaborators who uh, have been so wonderful to work with. And uh, most importantly, uh, most importantly um, uh, none of these study would be possible without the dedication of our study participant uh, to uh, many of these studies. And we are very grateful uh, as always. And many of them, as you can see from the data has been part of this study for over two decades. And um, we're also very uh, thankful to all our uh, funding agent. And thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks for an outstanding uh, a talk, Shu. Really, um, really terrific. Um, Nadia, you have a question. Hello. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk. Beautifully given. Um, I had a question about uh, the individuals treated for 20 years on ART and the post-treatment controllers. What do you think is the nature of the immune selection that's going on? Because I'm assuming they didn't have the protective HLA alleles. And so, so what actually drives it so that the intact proviruses end up in these heterochromatic regions? Yeah, no, Nadia, thanks for the question. Is is actually, that's what, as I mentioned, this is really the key point now for us to try to accelerate this selection and to understand what immune you know, factor really driving this. Um, I, I wouldn't think this is a, any single factor would contribute um, to this e effect. And especially probably different people would have a different um, immune responses that actually helps uh, to a different degree. Um, CDA T cells is definitely one of the consideration, but I think more and more data as you and me know is pointing to NK cells as well. Um, so that, and then also like Bob and Janice showing even um, the autologous neutralizing antibody not as broad as what we hope for, it can still help, uh, like, uh, help clear some of these um, 
periodically reactivated um, reservoir cells. So I think it's really a, a, a task for all of us to continue working on and see what we can learn from these long-term ART treated individuals who had this block lock reservoir profile and from EV controllers for sure. Um, in those without, without protective yield even, and um, how, what's, what's the major contributor? How do we translate? Do you think population. it's possible in different individuals there are different drivers, like more NK mediated in some, and then you know more um, T cell mediated in others? Yeah, yeah, that's what I I think. Um, nobody's there's nothing created equal equally. Actually, many of these uh, individual ED, ED controllers is such a diverse population. There will be subgroup of the ED controller that have different immune control mechanisms operational there. So we really need to learn from large number of these uh, study participants, and then think about what can be translated to the general population, what is really unique to these people genetically that we can't easily mimic. So system immunology approach probably the, the, the best way forward in a sense. Thank you. Great, Ro Rowena. Uh, hi, Shu. I have um, two, I think, probably quick questions. I hope that's okay. Um, in terms of speeding up the response, I think that the technical aspect of this is probably impossible, but there's no way to work out what the antigen specificities are of these persisting cells with intact proviruses. Like after you've done all the sorting for, you know, where the integration site is, that they're intact. Sorry, I don't think I fully understand. The... Well, um, I was thinking of your approach to um, do a therapeutic immunization. And if you, or if you wanted to simulate the cells with a specific antigen to get them to wake up, produce the virus, whatever. But if you knew the antigen specificities of those cells, that would be easy. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Actually, that, that's definitely um, something we don't know. Um, and I, I don't think the technology is, is advanced enough to capture these cells and really characterize what part of the virus is being expressed on the surface if they were to be reactivated. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, maybe CD8 T cells is one arm, but NK cells that is less dependent on uh, antigen specificity could be another arm of immune responses uh, that we can um, uh, explore there for, for cure. Yeah, I mean, you're already obviously on the edge of technology. My other question is not um, really related. In these people who over time, either on our or off, um, they have increasing amounts of their intact provirus in these non-genic regions and they're not transcribing as much, do they zero revert? And if they do, is there a pattern to the loss of antibodies against specific antigens? That's a very good question. I mean, we try to uh, answer this um, a little bit, but not really analyze all the study participants in our cohort. Um, and clearly some, I would say a small fraction of these individual even some of the ED controllers uh, and long-term ART, they actually do reduce their um, antigen level and the antibody responses, but the majority of them actually maintain their um, strong Western blood uh, responses. So I don't think we have a unifying um, kind of phenomena there yet. Great, and uh, Michael Peluso had uh, a nice question in the chat. Michael, do you wanna? Unmute and ask it. Or if you can't unmute, I can um, ask it for you. He was he was wondering whether uh, during uh, those cases of rebound, when the virus starts coming back up, um, uh, does it? Um, uh, uh, how long does it take to you know, repopulate uh, those uh, genic regions with uh, uh, intact uh, provirus? You know. Um, is that a rapid process or does it take some time? Oh, that's an interesting question. We actually didn't study that time point and we could easily do that. And now the reservoir size will be much bigger there um, as we kind of anticipated. That's, that's an interesting question, but I can imagine many of them will be reinfected and um, it, as the initial early infection, uh, acute infection, majority of the intact flowers will still enter in the genetic locations. Actually, yeah, we um, that's a great question. We actually have some leukopax pre and post treatment eruptions that that we could share with you guys to sort of answer that question. 
Do you already work always. together or do you already share samples from your dare to all the time? Yeah. Yeah, we should just ship our entire repository back to Boston. <laughs> save, save on our freezer costs. Just... <laughs> freezer space, right? <laughs> hey, can I just uh, shoot? I want to get you in trouble here um, mm -hmm. and ask you about a very controversial area of medicine that you're sort of in. You know, your your data here suggests that over time, over 20 years of therapy, right, the, the intact reservoir in the relevant areas are going down, and we may or may not be able to cure someone eventually. But that's not the question. The question is other people you know are saying the opposite, that if they look at people on long-term therapy, 20 years, there's evidence that the reservoir is actually increasing. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm wondering if I, I actually just assume, well, both can happen, right? That some people it goes down forever, we may cure them, and other people, there may be some proliferation going on, the reservoir starts to increase late. Your thoughts on that, and particularly, have you guys seen that in any of your patients uh, that you look at these people that the reservoir increases, not decreases? No, actually, most of the people are increasing. After initial drop, when they have the reservoir size uh, stabilized, and they're actually increasing. The reason they're increasing, as I showed, after 20 years, you see those big intact clones that is in those block lock position. They just they're not being recognized by the immune system. That's why they're expanding. They can persist. So where are they? When they expand, where are they? They are, oh, what do you mean, where are they? They are, the, the this analysis we analyze is the peripheral blood cells and the virus is located in the uh, block lock position. So those are oh, the, the cells. Right, but no, they, they, but they really shouldn't, but if you do virus outgrowth, you people are seeing that the reservoir size is increasing so that you'd expect them to be in the, in yes. the, in the, in the active okay. area. So this is really depends on what I say you are looking at, right? So what we see is the intact reservoir, is cell, reservoir cells with intact proviruses in these block lock position is expanding because they have survival benefit. They are not being right. recognized in the system. But the reservoir cells um, with the intact proviruses in these uh, open chromatins, they are decreasing. That's what our sequencing data indicate. But if you right. use viral outgrowth assay to yeah. test I mean, none of these, we never say these are the irreversible um, viruses at all. So they can be reactivated when you get so ma mass uh, a stimulation in vitro. So you, this really depends on the ICO you use, what you are saying. The, the viruses that inducible size of the proviruses probably expanding because the reservoir cells expanding in vivo. But whether they can be uh, easily reactively in vivo or not by the autologous shock signal, that's a big question. So far, what we see from EV controllers, they have large reservoir, intact reservoir cells, they are not being reactivated for decades uh, in vivo. Yeah, but they have an immune response that's helping them. But, but I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll stop that because this can go on forever. But honestly, yeah. if you look at some of the EV controllers, if they control mm -hmm. very well, the immune response is not strong. The CDL keys are, they have memory responses. You can proliferate them when you do the proliferation assay. But if you just look at interfering uh, some of the cytokines, they actually very weak responses because they didn't need it. They've never seen antigen again. So it really depends on the, the patients. Um, yes, if there's reactivation in vivo, their immune response will be reactive very quickly because they have good memories. Um, but not necessarily they are always there to, to surprise. It's really the reservoir profile that the, I, I believe is enables the, the immune control in this patient. Really, you can tell this uh, has been just such a rich uh, discussion inspired by your talk. Uh, Zhu, thank you so much uh, uh, thank for, you for, um, having me. Uh, for coming. And, um, uh, at, at this point, we're going to transition into the next hour uh, uh, of the program, and I'm going to pass the baton uh, to Nevin Krogan, um, um, uh, who's um, uh, going to tell us about uh, the Heart Center um, um, as, as part of our uh, CIFAR spotlight, um, and, um, uh, and followed by uh, a, a couple of talks from uh, Heart investigators who he will introduce. So Nevin, take it away. Hi guys, um, thanks for the opportunity. I'm just looking to see where this, click here. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for to um, 
uh, Peter and Monica for this opportunity to tell you about ongoing efforts in the Hark Center. And um, I think we could use this opportunity to explore how we could have tighter relationships with the, the CIFAR community here um, in, in the Bay Area and, and beyond. And the Hark Center is a center grant. Uh, it's a U54 center grant. Um, actually, this was a center grant that's been around for many years. More recently, it was at NAGMS, and then it uh, switched over to NAID as we just recently renewed it. And it's being led by um, David McDonald. That's our program officer, actually. I think I see David's name on the list here. So um, the focus here of this center grant is to try to biochemically and biophysically and structurally characterize um, HIV human protein protein interactions and um, uh, protein complexes. And uh, today we have two um, up and comer, the future really of HIV research, I would say, especially in the world of latency. Um, uh, representing the Hark Center, Nancy Archin is going to be talking about lat latency disruption in the HIV reservoir um, at the University of North Carolina, and then Judd Hulquist at Northwestern in Chicago. He'll be telling about some of his work in the TAT-dependent transcriptional rewiring, and I was using this information to identify um, agents that um, manipulate um, a latency. So there are 19 uh, PIs associated with the Hark Center. The majority on the West Coast at UCSF, Berkeley, and at the Hutch in um, Seattle. Um, but then we have other places represented as well, including the two speakers in, in Chicago and, and Chapel Hill um, with um, uh, Judd and um, Nancy. And one of the mantras that we have in the Hark Center is this idea of trying to go from systems to structure, trying to use unbiased quantitative proteomic and genetic approaches to identify and validate HIV human protein complexes that then would be looked more deeply uh, biophysically and, and, and structurally. And here's a, a couple of structures that the Hark Center had characterized um, uh, recently, um, one involving the, the, the protein um, VIF. That's actually one of the projects that we're focusing on in this renewal in the Hark Center. Um, this is work led by John Gross. VIF hijacks a colon containing ubiquitin ligase complex to ubiquitin and degrade uh, a series of restriction factor, the apoBAC3 uh, proteins. Um, and here's another structure. Uh, this was worked on by Alan Frankel's group, looking at REV, uh, another HIV protein uh, bound to CRIM1 and um, RAN. And this is a complex involved in the, the um, export, uh, import of um, the viral um, RNA. So there's a couple of examples of the structural characterization of um, HIV proteins and complexes that the Hark Center has been involved in. And this just got renewed um, for another five years. And this is how we've got it framed presently into three projects. The first one focused on the VIF APOBAC3 complex, again, led by John Gross. The second one led by Alan Frankel, um, regulation of HIV transcription and latency. And then the third project is focused on a genetic characterization of host factors, which is um, a project led by Alex Marson, who's at the Gladstone and at UCSF as well. And just to tell you a little bit more details here, um, about uh, the projects. You know, as I said, um, uh, the first project's focused on the VIF APOBAC3 um, set of complexes, I guess. Um, and um, John's looking deeply along with other members of the center at the degradation of these APOBAC3 proteins um, with this um, ligase complex hijacked by VIF. Also looking at the evolution, looking at it in HIV and, and SIV in human cells and in, and in monkey cells respectively. Also, VIF's role uh, with respect to, to, to packaging. Looks like RNA is playing a bigger role here with VIF's function than previously um, uh, recognized. Um, project two here is focused on um, both TAT and um, REV, um, again, led by Alan Frankel. So of course, TAT manipulates the, the, this PTFB complex, this kinase that's been known for many years more recently. There's, um, it's been realized there's the super elongation complex. This is a larger chromatin complex that's connected to PTFB that the Hark Center has been involved in characterizing, and that's linked to um, a latency. But there's ubiquitin ligase complex that Alan had recently found um, that's involved in ubiquitinating and degrading this machinery. Um, another connection here with um, another ligase, TRAF6, is being followed up on as well by the Frankel group and other groups affiliated with Hark. And then, of course, we have, as I said, uh, projects focused on REV and its manipulation of uh, CRIM1 
and RAN and uh, its involvement here in the export of the viral RNA. And the last project is really a technology one where, uh, led by Alex Marson, where we're carrying out, I would say, really bleeding edge CRISPR based studies. Um, obviously, in cell lines, but more recently, Alex has um, got this uh, amenable for primary cells, which to me is very exciting, both in arrayed format and in pooled uh, uh, format. And uh, Judd um, has been involved in, in, in this work as well. And to me, this is like a toolbox that's opening up a brand new area of biology with respect to, to HIV function. Um, and uh, we're using these CRISPR-based approaches in a variety of different ways to probe HIV uh, function. Um, and you know, the Heart Center is really focused on technology. It always has been, and that's one of the more exciting aspects of this center. Obviously, um, uh, we have strong genetics, like I just alluded to, not just CRISPR knockout, but CRISPR I and CRISPR A, CRISPR knock in as well. And this is all tied to the proteomics core that we have, the genetics core, to look globally at the host using um, uh, global approaches like abundance and, and post translational modification analysis, also looking at protein protein interactions, and then um, using kind of the affinity tag purification approach um, to characterize the complexes. Um, not just proteomically, but structurally as well. And all of this information gets fed here into the computational core to look at the HIV human networks and then also do integrative modeling to get a deeper insight into the HIV human um, protein protein interactions in the protein complexes. And that's led by Andre Shally here at UCSF. And the last slide I just want to show you this to me is actually the thing I'm actually most excited about. And th th this pipeline that we'll put together that's, I think, very unique to the Bay Area because it combines the strengths, the technological strengths here at UCSF, combining CRISPR, mass spectrometry, and cryo-EM. In fact, this is a, a pipeline we're calling the HARC endogenous protein structure platform, but it's a platform that now we're applying to many other disease areas, but it was first developed here in the HARC Center. And in this context, we're using CRISPR to put affinity tags on the genome and primary cells of human genes that we think are um, uh, intimately involved in HIV uh, infection. Okay, then we're purifying those proteins with the affinity tag and doing a number of things, looking at protein protein interactions by mass spec standard stuff, also native mass spec to get a more of the stoichiometry, stoichiometry of these complexes, and then cross linking mass spec as well to look at the topology of these complexes. And then also going right from cells to cryoEM. To me, that's incredibly innovative. And then the idea is to put together all this information in our modeling core to kind of accurately see what the complexes. Uh, look like plus and minus the HIV proteins. And we're doing this plus and minus HIV infection. And I should also say we're interfacing um, or we'll be interfacing more with Steve Deeks here, looking at some uh, variants that are popping up in, in certain populations to see what effects they have on the, the interaction networks and, and, and the complexes. So this is something now that we're kind of gearing up to do more systematically. And again, I think it really accentuates the, 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 the technological advancements that are unique here to uh, the Bay Area. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to the two speakers. Um, first, we have Nancy Archin um, talking about latency, disruption, biological sex, and HIV reservoir. Again, she's from the University of North Carolina. And then uh, Judd Hulquist will come after talking about harnessing TAT-dependent transcriptional rewiring to develop dual-acting latency reversal and promoting um, agents. So with that, I will pass over the baton to uh, Nancy. Let me load up my slides. Hey, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. a minute. Okay, so thank you, Nevin, again, for this lovely introduction and for the invitation to share my research. Uh, so today I'll be discussing some of our work to characterize the HIV reservoir in women and also share some recent data in our quest to define more efficacious approaches to reverse latency with the idea, of course, that more robust HIV antigen production will perhaps drive more effective clearance of persistently infected um, cells as part of a cure strategy, and I'll also um, highlight some of the work 
that my lab is proposing to do under HARP. So if increasing access to effective HIV prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, HIV infection has become more or less a manageable chronic health condition. However, as you all know, um, a cure is desperately needed as HIV disease is a lifelong infection and a significant number of HIV infected individuals still lack access to antiretroviral therapy. And importantly, as shown in this slide here, more than half of the people living with HIV infection are women, but unfortunately women are traditionally um, left out of um, cure research. And although the study is old, it's six years old, but what Kerner et al. showed, and this is with Rena Johnston, is that only about 11% of Q studies enrolled women. And so one of the implications of that, for instance, is that most of what we know about the HIV reservoir comes from studies involving men, but a clear knowledge of sex specific factors that might influence maintenance or the clearance of the HIV reservoir are important attributes uh, to consider for cure approaches. And there are many biological factors that can affect HIV persistence in the reservoir in women. Factors such as sex hormones may influence persistence HIV infection. Um, for instance, it was reported that during active infection, HIV RNA levels were shown to vary with the menstrual cycle in the female genital tract, um, and it was thought due, this was due to estrogen, as lower plasma viral loads observed during the secretary phase of the menstrual cycle when estrogen levels are at, at their peak. And also, um, Soltec et al. reported that um, estrogen, um, it can inhibit HIV by inducing a complex formation with uh, the transcription factor beta catenin and the estrogen receptor alpha on the HIV promoter to suppress HIV transcription. We also know that type 1 interferon responses are more robust in women. Uh, PDCs derived from women produce um, higher amount of interferon alpha in response to TLR ligand stimulation and drive um, greater CD8 T cell activation in vitro. And estrogen can also enhance the ability of PDCs to respond to TLR7 um, stimulation. And these higher levels of interferon alpha and also in interferon stimulating gene induction in women might explain some of the differences in the clinical manifestations of HIV-1 infection between men and women, including the better control of HIV viremia by women uh, during primary infection as a consequence of the anti-HIV-1 effect of um, interferon alpha. Uh, women are also more likely to be spontaneous controllers of HIV. Women are overrepresented in post-treatment control cohorts. Uh, they are reported to have lower levels of plasma viremia and higher CD40 cell count than, women, than men. And in untreated infection, as I mentioned before, levels of viremia are up to 40% lower um, in women compared to men. However, women are more likely to um, progress rapidly to AIDS um, than men. And this is thought to be because of the higher levels of T cell activation um, in women um, compared to men for uh, a given viral load. So in order to gain a better understanding of sex differences in HIV reservoir size, we performed a cross-sectional study where uh, 22 odds suppressed HIV seropositive women were matched one-to-one -one based on age and race uh, to 22 um, of 39 odds suppressed men. And as a secondary analysis, we also compared the 22 women to all 39 men uh, adjusting for age and race as covariates. We limited our matching to just um, age and race to avoid overmatching on in pathways that are be, that that are in factors that are that might be part of the uh, causal pathway. But as I'm showing here in the um, in this table, um, showing the participant characteristics. You can see that the population is relatively pretty balanced in terms of age, years suppressed, years on therapy, CD4 count, and uh, the nadir um, CD4 T cells, pre art nadir. We first compared the frequency of replication competent um, HIV 
Um, and this was done by performing the um, QVOA to measure outgrowth virus. We did this in the match men versus uh, the match women. And then we also compared all the men, as I mentioned, to all the women in the secondary analysis. And um, although we saw this trend towards a smaller reservoir in women, this trend did not achieve um, statistical significance. Um, so basically the inducible replication, um, re replication competent reservoir in men and women as measured by us was, um, was more or less similar, although there was a trend towards a smaller reservoir in women. We also measured the reservoir using the intact bovirus DNA assay to assess the frequency of both intact and defective boviruses in men versus women. And although um, I should mention that the IPDA can still overestimate the frequency of intact boviruses, uh, nevertheless, we observed similar frequencies of intact and defective boviruses in, um, in both men and women. Um, <laughs> Eileen Scully et al. compared the reservoir in 26 men and 26 women. And uh, these men and women were matched on duration of suppression, CD4 count, uh, Nader CD4. Um, so a lot more extensive matching than we did. Um, and what they um, did, they looked at integrated um, HIV DNA, total HIV DNA, and multiply, multiply splice and unsplice um, HIV RNA. And what they saw is that they observed no difference in DNA levels like we did. Um, however, they did observe that women had lower residual plasma viremia and um, lower inducible uh, multiple splice RNA compared to men. And more recently, uh, Jessica Proger um, and Tom Quinn's group studied a larger cohort of Ugandan men and women, comparing 57 females versus 33 uh, men. They reported about a twofold lower inducible reservoir. And again, this is uh, they're using the QBOA to measure uh, replication competent HIV. Um, and they observed that there was a twofold lower inducible reservoir in Ugandan women versus men. Uh, but like us and Scully, they did no, not see a difference um, in total proviral DNA between the sexes. So I should mention that interestingly, interestingly the um, difference in IUPM they observed was within the upper 95% CI of our study. So I think that the difference in inducible reservoir is there, but it's small and larger, um, um, a larger ends of study subject may be needed to see um, a difference. And another point to consider here too is that um, this is the uh, Ugandan cohort and that they're looking at predominantly subtypes DNA. So this is our cohort, which was predominantly subtype B. So uh, sex differences in HIV persistence is very complex uh, with mixed findings across different studies. And I've listed a bunch of other studies that have looked at this. Um, Studies finding a significant difference in reservoir size between men and women typically show about a twofold difference in persistent HIV frequencies between men and women. Uh, the biological implications of this is not really well known. Uh, but interestingly, it seems that most of the differences observed between men and women seems to be in the inducible reservoir, which led us to question as are there differences in the proviral landscape that contributes to differences in the inducibility of the reservoir between men and women? And this is one of the questions we're exploring under the HAWC. Um, and uh, we're doing this, I'm doing this in collaboration with Dr. Lillian Korn at the Fred Hutch, where we are proposing to look at proviral sequence um, analysis um, across the sexes. Um, to determine whether or not there are differences between uh, men and women that could contribute to the inducibility of uh, the HIV reservoir. So one of the many approaches under investigation, as you heard earlier, is to clear latent HIV, is to target the many pathways controlling HIV latency with small molecules um, uh, called LRAs to induce um, the virus out of latency. And once the cell is making virus particles, it can then be recognized by the immune system and be killed. And art would block surrounding uninfected cells from becoming infected. And adding an immunotherapy arm would boost the immune system and potentially make uh, 
make the infected cells better and being cleared up by the immune um, system. Um, so there are several of these latency uh, agents that have moved into the clinics. However, uh, clinical studies employing latency reversal and clearance strategies to date have had really um, very limited success. Um, and this could be due because of a combination of a number of things, including uh, clinical toxicities from global T cell activation, perhaps insufficient latent re latency reversal by the current LRAs that are available, and likely to a failure to engage and an effective viral clearance um, by, the immune, um, by the immune system. And in a recent study, a group demonstrated that administration of the small molecule AZD552 to non-human primates led to a significant increase in plasma viremia in outsuppressed um, SIV-infected macaques compared to macaques receiving placebo. And here I'm showing you the placebo groups in blue and the viral blips um, that are observed, that were observed in um, macaques receiving AZD5582. Um, henceforth, I'll refer, I'll refer to that molecule as IAPI. Um, so this observation where we see this blip of viremia was also observed um, in um, HIV-infected um, odd suppressed humanized mice. Um, and a significant increase in HIV RNAs um, in tissues of mice was also ob observed. However, the induction of HIV GARG RNA in resting CD4 T cells isolated from odd suppressed individuals ex vivo was only about a two fold. So it, essentially, it was no better than the um, current LRAs. Um, that have been already tested in uh, the clinic, which suggests that there is room for improvement. And our idea was that can we combine um, AZD5582 or IAPI with LRAs targeting different pathways controlling HIV latency in order to induce more robust HIV RNA. And this makes made sense for us, and I'm not going to go into this slide into detail, but because as just to remind you that um, HIV latency is controlled by multiple mechanisms, and therefore combining um, LRAs targeting these different um, uh, pathways perhaps might be more robust at inducing um, HIV expression. And the rationale is that Again, you would re reactivate a broader population of latent poor virus by combining um, LRAs targeting different pathways. You can induce higher levels of poor virus expression in individual cells. And then you could potential, potentiate latency reversal activity at lower drug um, uh, exposures to reduce toxicities um, that can occur from, um, from some drugs. So um, we tested this hypothesis using a JERCAT model where we screened several classes of LRAs. And this, was, uh, this work was done by uh, my former graduate student, Paul Sinelli. Um, <clears throat> we combined several classes of LRAs with um, AZD to identify combinations that synergistically reactivated HIV from latency. And I'm showing you in uh, black stain blue here, we found that the combination of the uh, bed inhibitors and um, AZD showed robust increase in latency reversal without overt um, toxicity. Uh, we then did single um, cell analysis, sequencing RNA sequencing analysis to look at the um, transcripts being made. And of course, we saw that the majority of the transcripts from the combination of IAPI and the bed inhibitor were actually HIV transcripts. Um, and again, this is in uh, the JERCAT cell model. We then um, use this combination to test CD4 T cells isolated from HIV infected individuals who are stably suppressed. Um, and we saw that compared to single uh, drug treatment, we observe an enhancement up to eightfold in HIV GAG RNA expression in cells exposed to the combination of uh, the BET inhibitor and um, IAPI. And this was especially true for the combination of the PET ben, um, PIN BET inhibitors um, and um, AZD. And bio, viability of the cells were not significantly um, affected, although I'm not showing you this here today. 
However, to our surprise, um, also, although we saw this robust um, induction of HIV RNA, when we looked at um, HIV protein by using the um, ultra-sensitive HIV P24 um, detection using the CIMOR, we were very disappointed because of, although we see this robust induction of HIV RNA with the combination of the IAPI and BED inhibitor, we did not see this recapitulated in um, the amount of antigen that was being produced. Um, we also tested this using the Kilvoa, where we um, uh, using resting CD40 cells from stably suppressed HIV infected individuals, uh, where we combined AZD with BET um, inhibitor. And again, we did not observe clear enhancement of viral outgrowth in cells exposed um, to the combination of AZD and um, BET inhibitor. Um, and we, um, and I won't have time to go into this into details, but um, what we think is happening is that uh, the limit in antigen production is likely a result of inefficient elongation, splicing, and polyadenylation, even with the combination of IBET and AZD. So we see this robust um, production of HIV RNA in both cell lines and in resting CD40 cells, but however, we did not detect significant amount um, of antigen with this combination, which was a little bit of a letdown. But as we explore using different LRAs to induce HIV from latency, um, one thing we should uh, take into consideration is the effect of estrogen, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and this paper was published by Jonathan Kahn and his group a couple of years ago. Um, basically what it showed that in the presence um, of estrogen, you can actually get um, that, that estrogen can actually blunt um, uh, reactivation of HIV latency. And this seems to be even more pronounced um, in cells from women shown here in red compared to, um, to men. So um, we can say that sex differences are still important to consider in HIV cure research trials. Um, and again, the suppressive effect of estrogen HIV expression may, for instance, confound the interpretation of anti-latency uh, therapeutic trials. Uh, LRAs are with safe um, pharmacokinetic profile that robustly drive not only um, HIV RNA expression, but also protein expression. So these cells can be cleared um, is you know, um, an unmet need. And a uh, combination of LRAs targeting the non canonical and F kappa B pathway together, multiple LRAs targeting specific pathways controlling HIV latency, perhaps may increase the breadth of proviruses emerging from latency. We just have to determine what those specific combinations should be. And this is one of the questions we're again ask, asking another hawk How do we leverage targeting the non canonical? and F kappa B signaling pathway to increase the breadth of proviruses merging from latency. Um, and so to have this antigen production so we can have clearance of these cells. And we are um, also fo focusing on latency re reversal in myeloid cells. And then we also want to take into consider consideration the role of estrogen and estrogen receptor signaling while we're targeting the non canonical and F kappa B signaling pathway. Uh, by um, involving um, samples from uh, both men and women and, um, and tissues. So with that, I would like to thank um, many of the people who are involved, people from my laboratory, especially Shane, um, who has led both of these studies as a former graduate student in my lab. Uh, the uh, many people in the lab, Jennifer, uh, Brigitte and Shipra, who spent a lot of time in the hood, um, our former laboratory members were also involved in um, this project. My uh, UNC HIV Q Center collaborators, uh, David Margulis, Nilu, um, and Anne Marie Turner, although I forgot to put her name there. A clinical um, team spent a lot of time recruiting these patients. Uh, the UNC Ys were um, a lot of participants were recruited. And we also got at least four patients came from the UCSF Ys. And the UNCC for Biostat Core, 
uh, helped us a lot, especially the women um, studies analysis, statistical analysis, our study participants and our current funders, including uh, the HARC, uh, where some of these questions that I just paused uh, will be um, uh, interrogated. And with that, I'll stop sharing and take any questions that you have. Oh, Nadia, do you have a question? Yes. Um, great talk, Nancy. Thanks. Uh, I have a question sort of tying together your talk and Shu Yu's talk. Um, and so you had showed that there's no difference in um, intact proviral DNA between the men and the women in your cohort. And, and Shu Yu nicely showed that um, you know, the, the intactness matters, but also where it is, whether it's in heterochromatin or not. Um, and so do you have plans to, um, to look at that? And, and with the hypothesis be given that women are overrepresented as post-treatment controllers, mm -hmm. would the hypothesis be that you might actually see more of that intact DNA in the heterochromatin regions? And I don't know, that's something you're doing with Lily Cohen, like, like what you mentioned there. But. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we are proposing to do with Lily, um, to actually uh, profile the, the chromatin landscape in men and women to see, um, to look at, um, the proviruses, the, the whether or not we see more, um, what what the sequences, just profile the sequences, and also the integration side of, of men and women. Yeah. Nice. And then I have a second question. Um, so, given the role of estrogen in um, regulating HIV transcription, is there any evidence that um, before versus after menopause that that kind of like post treatment controller status might change, or you know, is there anything known about that? Um, that's a very good question. I haven't read anything about that. Um, I know um, there are, yeah, I haven't, I can't say I haven't read anything looking specifically at post-treatment controllers and um, and pre and post-menopause. Steve, do you know by any chance? No, I've been, that was my question to you. Maybe yeah. Monica can help here, but I mean, a broader question, Nadia, and I know Monica studied this, does, what effect does menopause have, and hence hormones, I guess, on, on viremia, an untreated infection, T cell mm -hmm. activation, or the activity of the reservoir? Um, I think, Nancy, you may know yeah. about the reservoir stuff, but what about just viremia and T cell activation? Monica, you want to jump in? I mean, it's uh, it's very interesting because if we think about the differences in viremia set points between men and women, those were most, you know, before treatment, they were most marked prior to menopause. Um, and there are all sorts of um, theories invoked why you would have a lower viral load in women than men that had to do with estrogen um, and and there were even differences in pregnancy, which had to do with progesterone. But after menopause, um, I don't have a lot of data on the natural history, but it doesn't seem like this. I would I'd be curious from you if the differences disappear when the estrogen levels go down. Um, the only thing I can say is the, the most recent study I could think of was the one that was done, done by Jonathan Cohn, where they looked at the, um, and Sarah Geronella, where they looked at using Y samples, where they looked at women of the same participants, women of pre- um, of productive age and uh, after they reach menopause and looking those samples over time. And what I remembered is that they did see this, um, like this, it's, it was easier basically to, to induce HIV transcripts from women who are men, when they are in menopause compared, compared to when they are in reproductive age. Suggesting again, maybe um, like the estrogenic environment during a productive age may be suppressive to HIV transcription. Right. And whether exogenous hormones change that would be interesting too, both yeah. in estrogen replacement therapy and in transgender management. Yeah. All right, any other questions for Nancy? Um, Steve Yuko has, Steve. Um, hi, Nancy. Um, that was a fabulous talk. I learned a Thanks. lot. Um, I do have a quick question. I 
Um, I like your hypothesis about the fact that some of these LRAs may not induce uh, polyadenylated and multiple spliced HIV transcripts, because we've seen that also with some of these LRAs and testing them ex vivo in patient mm -hmm. cells. But I found it interesting that the um, the AZD compound did induce plasma viremia in some right, of the non right. primates, which yeah. seems to imply that they must have made um, completed and spliced transcripts. So I'm wondering, do you think this is a difference between non-human primates and humans or in vivo versus ex vivo? Or is it just a sampling error of the cells that we can test ex vivo just don't represent the cells that are producing the virus in vivo? What do you think is going yeah, on? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I mean, these questions, uh, we think about it all the time. Definitely whatever is happening in vivo is we not it's not being recapitulate, recapitulated in ex vivo, whatever we're doing. And it's possible to, I mean, for instance, are the, is the virus coming from, you know, what cell type is it coming from in vivo, right? We don't know. I mean, what we do is my lab does mostly T cell work. Um, really, I do all T cell work, I should say. Um, so, um, and then it's possible too that the cells in vivo may not be as, you know, as uh, latent, like deep latency, at least in uh, animal models that we've, they've been tested. And so that all the transcription factors may be available um, that may not be true in cells that you get from a person where would, who's been on therapy forever. So that's another possibility, yeah. But we did do your assay to learn about the, the elongation and the polyadenation. So that came really handy. Great, thanks. I don't see any other questions here. So um, thank you, Nancy. Awesome talk. Thank you. And we, yeah, we're now going to transition here to um, Judd Hallquist at Northwestern University. Awesome. Thanks much, Nevin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Greetings from Chicago. Um, so this story is actually a new story that my lab has been developing. And as Nevin kind of introduced at the beginning of his Hark Center introduction, and one of the goals of the center is to characterize host factor complexes and their roles in HIV replication and latency. And in our sort of journey doing that with some TAP dependent complexes, we actually identified what we think is a first in class molecule that acts both as a latency reversing agent, but also as a latency promoting agent Agent, and it depends on the presence or absence of TAP. So I kind of want to define just a couple terms quick, and then we'll do a deep dive on uh, transcriptional elongation. So as we all know, the persistence of the HIV latent reservoir is a major barrier to the development of a functional cure. So after initiation of antiretroviral therapy, um, you'll get a quick decrease in viral plasma loads, sometimes below the limit of detection, as long as the ART regimen is being strictly adhered to. Um, and while those individuals cannot transmit the virus, um, they are not cured, because as soon as ART were to be stopped, um, the virus will rebound typically within a couple weeks. Now, this rebound is due to the persistence of the virus in these latent reservoirs, which are composed of these long-lived cells that have transcriptionally inhibited proviruses in them that are not being cleared by the immune system. So there are a couple different theories or methods that people have been attempting to derive in order to clear this reservoir. Um, these range from direct gene editing to try to excise the provirus um, to boosting the immune system to try to control the virus naturally if um, ART were to be halted. But the two most common that people um, talk about are colloquially known as shock and kill and block and lock. Now, the idea behind a shock and kill strategy is that you would induce transcriptional activation of latent proviruses while on antiretroviral therapy. Those cells would ultimately be cleared by the immune system because they're expressing antigen. The virus wouldn't be able to infect new cells. So you deplete the reservoir. That means you can stop ART and have this delayed rebound. And if you can deplete the reservoir enough, ideally you would have a functional cure. 
Now, the idea behind block and lock is actually conceptually similar, but slightly different in that instead of reactivating this reservoir, you're trying to induce it to enter the state of deep latency where it can't stochastically reactivate. Same idea applies, you remove ART, and there's this delay to rebound, ideally a delay that is infinite. So those are the concepts, you know, a number of different latency reversing agents have been identified, as well as a number of different latency promoting agents that act through different mechanisms. But what we think we've stumbled upon is a compound that actually acts as both depending on the expression of TAT. So let me give you a little bit of background on TAT's function and host transcriptional elongation. So after integration of the provirus into the host genome, the virus depends on transcriptional um, host transcriptional machinery um, to express its RNA transcription products. Now, the first step of this, of course, is transcriptional initiation, which is mediated by cis elements included in the LTR promoter. These cis elements recruit transcription factors that then recruit RNA pol 2 and RNA pol 2 starts transcribing. However, within 20 to 60 nucleotides of transcription initiation, RNA pol 2 pauses in a process known as proximal promoter pausing. So proximal promoter pausing is actually quite universal across gene bodies in the human genome, and it's a way to regulate the persistivity of RNA pol 2 So how this uh, our RNA transcriptional elongation is regulated is through the action of a number of different host complexes. So after RNA pol 2 initiates, it pauses 20 to 60 nucleotides downstream, where it must be licensed to continue elongation. That licensing is controlled by a host factor complex known as PTEFB. Now, what PTEFB does is it phosphorylates the C-terminal tail of RNA pol 2 as well as negative elongation factors to remove those and initiate processive uh, transcription by RNA pol 2 Again, this happens at all human loci and at integrated proviruses. Now, the recruitment of PTEFB to RNA pol 2 is actually a highly regulated process. So normally what happens at a, a human gene body is PATH1 will bind to RNA pol 2 That helps actually reinforce that pause state until you recruit the super elongation complex. The, the SEC will subsequently recruit PTEFB. PTEFB will then phosphorylate RNA pol 2 and license elongation. So it's a complicated process and people have been studying it for many decades in many different contexts, not only HIV, but also in cancer. So HIV actually encodes sort of a, a short wire trick to get around prox uh, proximal promoter pausing. And to do that, it uses its accessory protein TAT. So what TAP does is after transcriptional initiation, the first 20 to 30 nucleotides of the HIV transcript will fold into a hairpin known as TAR. TAR binds to TAT and TAT directly recruits PTEFB. What PTEFB will do then is phosphorinate RNA pol 2 and initiate transcriptional elongation directly without having to go through the cumbersome process of PATH1C recruitment, the SEC recruitment, et cetera. So it kind of shortcuts that whole regulatory mechanism. Now, a number of biochemical studies done over a decade now did identify that TAT recruits other members of these complexes, including other SEC members. But the reason for this was always kind of murky. So if TAT is recruiting PTFB directly, why would it need to recruit the rest of the SEC if the SEC's only job is to recruit PTFB? So to begin to address this question, a graduate student in the lab, Will Cicernos, decided to take a gene editing approach to look at the role of these different complex members. So he used a CRISPR-Cas9 RNP approach to edit each super elongation complex member in primary T cells from nine different donors. So he designed four different guide RNAs per gene, complexed them with Cas9, and then delivered them to activated T cells by electroporation, subsequently challenged those cells with a GFP reporter virus, and followed replication over a seven-day spreading infection. The data I'm showing here is from day five, and it's normalized to our non-targeting negative control gene. 
So as we can see, when you knock up CXCR4, the co-receptor for the viral strain that we used, we get virtually no replication. When we knock out CCNT1 or CDK9, these are members of PTFB, we see a substantial decrease in infection across all donors. But when we knock out any other member of the super elongation complex, AF1, AF4, L2, or ENL, we get no significant decreases in infection, suggesting that the SCC actually isn't required for HIV replication in primary CD4s. Validation of the knockouts are shown in this Western here. But we also wanted to ask this question in an orthogonal way. So besides gene editing, we also wanted to approach this from a chemical perspective. So we collaborated with our neighbor at Northwestern, Dr. Ali Shalotiford, who has been working on mammalian transcriptional elongation complexes in the context of cancer. Now, Ali's lab a number of years ago had developed a super elongation complex inhibitor using a combination of structural docking and small molecule screening. Now, what these molecules do, which are called KL1 and KL2, is they inhibit the interaction between PTFB and the rest of the super elongation complex. So when we got these compounds from Ali and titrated them into primary CD4s and then challenged them, what we saw is that infection actually increased after we treated primary cells with these compounds, suggesting that the super elongation complex not only isn't required for infection, it actually may be inhibiting it. And we're currently following up on this um, result because we think what's actually happening is this compound is releasing more free PTFB for TAT uh, hijacking. So let's focus this back in on then on this model. So this you know, is the canonical model of how this is working, but we just saw data suggesting that the super elongation complex here isn't required. So if the super elongation complex isn't required for HIV transcription, what does that mean for the PATH complex? So you remember I said at the beginning that the PATH complex actually plays two roles in this process. One, it acts as a negative regulator of RNA-Pol2, but it also promotes transcriptional elongation by recruiting the SEC and recruiting PTFB. So if the SEC isn't required, that means that PATH1 should only be acting as a negative regulator. So to test that hypothesis, we'll again use a CRISPR-Cas9 approach to knock out each one of the subunits of the PATH1 complex in primary CD4s from three different donors. Here again, it's all relative to the non-targeting control. We see that our CXCR4 control ablates uh, replication. When we knock out CCNT1, a member of PTFB, it decreases infection. But when we knock out any one of the PTFB family members, or sorry, the uh, PAF1C complex members, we get an increase in replication, very similar to what we see if we knock out BRD4. Uh, none of these end up influencing cell viability. Now, again, this is a genetic approach. We also wanted to look at this chemically. So again, we went to our collaborator, um, Ali Shalotiford, and a postdoc in the lab, Shaime Solomon, to develop a first-in-class inhibitor of the PATH1C complex, which we term IPATH1C. Now, we did this using a combination, again, of structural docking and small molecule screening to inhibit the interaction between PATH1 and CTR9. If you inhibit that interaction, the entire complex falls apart. Now, when we take that compound and treat primary CD4s with it and then challenge them with HIV, we see a very similar result to what we saw when we used our SEC inhibitors. We see an increase in infection upon treatment. Of course, after you overtreat, the cells start to die, and then we see a fall off in infection. Now, this negative regulatory function of the PATH1 complex isn't unique. It was actually reported a couple of other times in the literature. You know, first in the context of a genome-wide shRNA screen published in 2011, they identified the PATH complex as a negative regulator of HIV replication. And also recently in the Science Advances paper showing that PATH1 um, is a negative regulator of transcription and latency. So because they showed that the PATH1 complex acts in latency, we also wanted to test our small molecules in the context of a latency model. So the data that we had shown so far is that the super elongation complex doesn't seem to be required for TAT-dependent transcription, and the PATH1 complex is actually acting as a negative regulator in viral replication. So if the SEC is not necessary, we would expect that the SEC inhibitors wouldn't have an effect on latency. And if the PATH1 complex is acting to restrict RNA polymerase, 
we would actually expect that inhibition of PAF1C would act as a novel LRA. So to test this, we turned to a JLAT model, uh, 5A8, which harbor a silent HIV provirus with the GFP reporter. You can add your LRA, the cells turn green, and then you can use flow to read out how many cells you reactivated. Now in blue here is DMSO, in red is our PAF1 inhibitor, IPAF1C. Now in the presence of just DMSO, we saw that IPAF1C actually didn't do anything. Now, at first, we scratched our heads about that a little bit, but in retrospect, it kind of makes sense. We're effectively removing the parking brake from RNA-Pol2, and RNA-Pol2 is just sitting there, not doing anything. So we have to also step on the gas to see this effect. So if we then add some of canonical LRAs, such as JQ1, PHA, PMA, or the SMAC mimetic AZD, we can see that IPAF1C actually synergizes with each one of those. And this is not specific to the 5A8 model. It also works in the JLAT 11.1s and 6.3s. So that's the PATH complex. What happens then with the SEC? Well, again, the SEC doesn't seem to be required for transcription. And when we use the SEC inhibitor KL2 in the combination with these other LRAs, we don't see any statistically significant differences um, compared to our DMSO control. Now, here is where sort of the trick comes in. So everything that I've been talking about so far has been in the presence of TAT. But let's do just a little bit of a thought experiment about what happens in the absence of TAT. So in the presence of TAT, we just saw that the super elongation complex wasn't necessary. TAT is recruiting PTFB, doesn't need the SEC. And the PATH1 complex is actually acting as a restriction factor. Well, in the absence of TAT, what we actually see should be the opposite, because without TAT to recruit PTFB, both PATH1 and the SEC are required for PTFB recruitment for, to initiate transcriptional elongation. So to put this in other words, if we're looking at our inhibitors, what we saw in the presence of TAT was that our PATH1 inhibitor was acting as a latency reversing agent, but in the absence of TAT, it should act as a latency promoting agent. So how can we test this? So to test this, we actually went back to a few older cell line models of HIV latency that had defective TAT-TAR axes. So the JLAT models actually have functional TAT-TAR. They have frame shift in ons, they're NEF minus, um, but they do have a functional TAT-TAR axis. Now, older cell line models such as ACH2 and U1, um, the ACH2s have mutants in TAR and U1s have mutants in TAT. So what happens if we use our compounds in the context of these models? So again, here we're showing um, reactivation in the U1 model in the presence of DMSO in blue or IPAF1C in red. And what we can see that in contrary to what we saw in the JLAT model, here IPAF1C is inhibiting reactivation of both JQ1 and PMA. We think it actually does the same with PHA and AZD, but we're still you know, optimizing our LRA concentrations in this system. So we see this in U1 cells. We also see it in ACH2 cells, which again have that defective TATAR axis, where when we titrate in IPAF1C, it actually prevents reactivation by JQ1 and PMA. So again, just to emphasize this point, the same molecule under the same conditions is acting oppositely in these two different cell line models that have differences in TAT. So in our U1 model, IPAF1C inhibits reactivation. This U1 have a deficient TATAR axis. And in the JLAT model, these IPAF1C molecules are reactivating or in synergizing with these other LRAs. Um, and these are TATAR proficient. So what we're actually seeing here is that these PATH1C inhibitors are acting to enhance reactivation in the presence of TAD. So they would be acting as a, in a shock and kill manner, but inhibiting reactivation in the absence of TAD, so block and lock. So if you imagine doing this in the context of patient cells, some cells of which are expressing TAD, some of which are not, this molecule may actually promote those expressing TAT to reactivate while suppressing and driving into deep latency those cells already not expressing TAD. So the last small piece of data I do want to share is we did take some of these and use them to treat our uh, patient cells. So we collaborated with Steve Walensky, who's part of the Max Wise cohort, um, and got four P 
PBMC vials from HIV patients in the cohort who had five plus cumulative years of ART. At the time of the blood draw, they had undetectable viral RNA levels. We treated with each of the LRAs listed here in the presence or absence of our PAF1C inhibitor. And when we measured cell-associated HIV RNA, we saw that even IPAF1C alone in these models are able to reactivate viral RNA expression. So where does that leave us? We think that we have now the first-in-class PAF1C inhibitors that act both as latency-reversing and latency-provoting agents in a TAP-dependent manner. So we have a couple of different questions that we're moving forward with now. You know, one, how does the IPAF1C synergize with more canonical latency promoting agents? We saw that it could synergize with LRAs. How does it interact with LPAs? Um, one experiment that we're really anxious to do, and I would love to get suggestions by email or even in the questions, is how we can monitor reactivation as a function of TAT expression. You know, it's easy to say TAT is there, now we see reactivation. How can we say TAT is not there and they're entering a deeper state of latency? It's something that we would love to show at a single cell level. Furthermore, we're trying to improve the efficacy of this compound through medicinal chemistry and also develop other compounds targeting other transcriptional elongation complexes. So with that, I want to acknowledge my fantastic group here at Northwestern, both in my lab and in the Center for Pathogenomics, our collaborators, Ali, Steve, Shaime, um, especially the work of my graduate student, Will, who really spearheaded this, um, despite the fact that I was wrong at almost every step of the way in what I predicted would happen. This project was actually originally funded through a supplement or pilot award through the Third Coast CIFAR. Um, without that award, we never would have done this. So I'm incredibly thankful for that mechanism that the CIFARs provide. And now, of course, it's being supported by our collaboration in the HARC. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, Zichong. Hi. Uh, Nevin yeah. had to run, so I'll, I will mediate questions. OK. So, Jack, thank you so much for the in very interesting presentation and the exciting discovery. I have a question. Um, uh, there are some reports showing that the active transcription is actually required to maintain an open chromatin structure uh, for, for, uh, for, for gene, uh, for gene uh, activity. So since your compounds, including PATH1 and KL1, uh, can reduce transcription elongation, do you expect that they can induce some kind of epigenetic changes that is durable even after, even after you remove your compounds from the culture? Yeah, and that's something we would really love to explore. And you know, Nancy's work prefaced this really well, where I think that we should be able to find combinations that, that work together. What we're really excited about the IPAF1C compound in particular is we, you know that in a, you know, person living with HIV, if you look at the latent reservoir, there are multiple different blocks acting in independent different cell types. Some yeah. of those might be more reactivatable than others. So what we're hoping is that this compound is going to both help reactivate those proviruses that are already on their way towards reactivation while mm -hmm. driving those that are more epigenetically silenced into a deeper state of latency. So exactly to your point, we would love to trust, try this inhibitor in the context of other latency promoting agents to see if we can induce more epigenetic changes at that site after we help, help clamp down on transcriptional elongation. Yeah, Great. that makes sense. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Steve. Um, hi, Judd. That was a fascinating talk, and and I found it really compelling. And um, I, you know, I believe the mechanisms of these these drugs, and I think they may be exactly what you want is a drug that um, helps promote uh, latency in those cells that are not transcribing HIV and helps to reactivate those that are already transcribing HIV. Um, so I think this is this is fascinating and great. I, I do have one comment. Um, which is that you probably should keep doing these experiments in cells from patients because the um, cell lines are all different um, and may not recapitulate patient cells. But uh, for example, the, the JLATs, there's a number of different clones, um, but in our studies of them, I think that they probably don't make much TAP, HIV, RNA, and probably protein. And then it looks like the mechanism of latency in a lot of the JLATs is transcriptional interference. Um, which is very different from the mechanism in the U1s and the ACH2s. So I think it can be hard to interpret the findings in, in JLATs and U1s and ACH2s. And I, I agree with 
studying them more in, in patient cells as you were as you were doing in your last slide. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that comment. Yeah, we, we're trying to use these cell lines, you know, as initial tools to help characterize some of these compounds. But I, I completely agree. There's no replacement for actually looking in the, the real, real samples. You know, one of the things that we would really love to do you know, with these compounds is you know, work with some more, you know, to prove the mechanism is to actually rescue these different cell lines and prove that it is TAT dependent. So for example, if we were to go into JLATs and you know, CRISPR-Cas9 out TAT or something to that effect, would we actually reverse the impact of those LRAs within that same cell line? Or vice versa, if we were to deliver TAT exogenously to U1s or ACH2s, is that going to flip the action of these IPAF1C molecule? That's what we would predict, but we haven't done that experiment yet. It's important to validate. I I, um, I think the JLATs is probably in general are not making much TAT, um, but but another possibility you could try is in a primary cell model of latency, um, uh, doing that, and then you can also do single cell studies where you can look at both TAT expression um, and um, sort of virus expression. But uh, yeah, I, I think these compounds are fascinating, and you definitely should keep studying them. Yeah, no, thanks. A coat. Um, <clears throat> hello. Hi. Yeah. Um. It's it's beautiful study. I really like um your your, your approach. So just uh um in terms of um SEC and that uh, performance, um knockdown knockout or or, or inhibitor study, would it be possible to interpret the data, um like when you remove sec beta interaction, for example, it actually um. Interrupt the interaction of between second uh, um, beta B on other genes, so that the P more beta Bs are available for HIV. Therefore, it activate transcription. That, would it be possible? Or, um, or yeah, and actually, so <clears throat> one of the slides that I had shown was that if we inhibit the formation of the super elongation complex, we actually see HIV infection go up. Yeah. Now, if we knock out F1, F4, or something like that, we don't see that same effect. Mm. So what we think the difference between the drug and our knockout is that when we're treating with the drug, we're actually releasing PTFB from other super elongation complexes. So there's just more PTFB floating around for TAT to hijack, and we think that's why we see that increase. We're doing some active you know, PTFB experiments now to prove that, but that that's how we interpret those data. But yeah, it it is possible, we think. Thank you. Uh, AJ, great talk as usual. Do you think yeah, um, sure. overexpressing PTFB will also have a similar effect as like releasing it from the company? As, as releasing it? So yeah. it's actually a grant that we're currently working on with CO is that PTFB levels are actually quite closely regulated and their activity is regulated not only on the level of protein expression, but also where it is in the cell and if it's being sequestered by the 7SK RNA complex. So simply overexpressing it might, might work, but hard to say without doing the actual, say, CRISPR-A experiment. Hi folks, it's 11.35, we can take one more question. Okay, thank you. We're seeing no other hands raised. Thank you everyone for coming out today. Thank you for the speakers, um, for sharing your work. Uh, we had a great turnout this morning. We're really excited about that. Uh, this uh, session will be uh, posted on the CIFAR website after it's gone through the transcription process of making sure that there's closed captioning. So thank you everyone. And um, you can check our website for the additional CIFAR seminars that are coming up in the coming months. Thank you.